I just wanted you to share a little bit about how you got to where you are today, starting with Alan Yang. Okay, great. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Riverside, California, which is like an hour from here, but is totally different from Los Angeles. It's kind of like a kind of crappy suburb that wishes it were Orange County, so like really low aspirations. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just a, I was a nerdy kid. I was like good at school and stuff, and I went to college and I majored in biology. But then I realized I hated doing that, so uh, I got on a comedy magazine in school and uh, just started writing jokes all the time. And I realized that's what I wanted to do. So uh, I graduated from school and moved out here, and then didn't really have any sort of. I had nothing, but I, I just wrote a bunch of specs over and over again, and wrote a bunch of joke packets. And my first job was on the probably the best comedic late night show, a uh, show called Last Call with Carson Daly. Uh, it's on at 1.30 in the morning on NBC. Still on, by the way. Still on. No comedy on it anymore. We pretty much killed that. But uh, that was my first job. And, and uh, I, I moved to New York and, and worked on that show. And uh, really, I mean, there's not a real great story. It's just I wrote like 10 spec scripts and sent them around and wrote a bunch of sketch packets. And uh, after I got on Last Call later, I moved to LA and wrote for South Park. And then after that, I started writing for Parks and Rec. Um, but yeah, so really boring first story, guys. Uh, well, no, that was, that was all right. So it's, it's an opener. Uh, yeah. you know? Now, uh, Karen, you're not excluded from this. So um, tell us your story and make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> really kill. <laughs> Um, I was born <laughs> in a brick house, no. Um, uh, really boring. I uh, started my career at ABC in New York, ABC Sports. Um, worked for someone who uh, was a rising star and got promoted. Uh, he moved me out to New York, uh, to Los Angeles when he became president of ABC Entertainment. Uh, so I learned the entertainment business with him. He moved back to New York. He's now CEO of Disney. I should have moved with him, but... <laughs> He still returns my emails faster than some of my colleagues do. Um, uh, I ran a not-for-profit film organization called the Black Filmmaker Foundation after that. And then I sold a series to HBO uh, that I produced based on uh, a comic book called Spawn. Um, three Emmys. That was good. Uh, uh, had my first child and uh, was going to be a stay-at-home mom slash producer. And then Disney called me and asked me if I would meet with them about their writer fellowship program and their, uh, their talent development area. I did, got the job, and within six months, my boss left and I became the head of that department. So I ran what is now the ABC Disney Fellowship Program, but I ran that program, some would say, into the ground. <laughs> gotta laugh at that. <laughs> laugh, laugh, laugh. <laughs> Just put your mic down when you wanna get a laugh. Okay, thanks. Killing. <laughs> It worked uh, again. <laughs> and then um, I had my, was pregnant with my second child. See, my career revolves around my children. Um, uh, and uh, Nickelodeon had pursued me about helping them start a, a program. So I left Disney and created the Nickelodeon Writer Fellowship Program. I worked in animation for a couple of years. And then um, NBC called me, and here I am. I oversee NBC's Writers on the Verge program, our diversity staffing initiative. We have a diverse development fund. We have a director fellowship program program. Um, I like to say my title is Vice President of Diversity Programs and all the other stuff no one else wants to do. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and Mr. Hi. Halstead Sullivan. Hi, I'm Halstead Sullivan. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I happen to go to the same high school as two of the actors on my show, Ed Helms and Bram Baumgartner, who plays Kevin on The Office. Um, of course, I say, oh, we went to high school together. And there is like, we went to the same high school. You're much older than us. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, I went to the University of Virginia, and when I graduated, I worked for the White House for two years, working, doing advance work for George Bush Sr., the good Bush. Um, so wherever he, wherever he flew, I would set up for his events and run them through, and it was a great way to see the world. Um, and then I went to law school, and thinking it was time to finally get serious, and within the first week of law school, I realized I had made a horrible mistake. Um, 
but not knowing what else I want to do. I you know, finished law school, but decided, well, entertainment sounds sort of cool, so I thought I'd do entertainment law. So I became the head of the Committee on Sports and Entertainment Law at my law school. And uh, in, that, in the course of that, I would call up high-powered entertainment attorneys and say, hi, would you like to come speak at our law school? And be like, oh, great. And I had a budget, and I'd fl fly them out, and they'd speak, and I'd pick their brain afterwards. And um, when I finished law school, I ended up working at CAA. CAA. Um, you probably don't know what that is, but <laughs> uh, I was in business affairs, and there's when I realized, oh, they're writers who you know write these shows, and I'm like, I've always been funny, so I actually joined the Groundlings program while I was there, and went through the Groundlings program, and out of that, uh, I got my first writing job on a show called Sister Sister, where I worked with David, and uh, the rest is on the sheet in front of you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know you wrote on Sister Sister. That's exciting. <laughs> Um, my name's Aisha Muhar, and um, I feel like my story is basically the same as Alan's, but like two years behind, so basically <laughs> starting off. Um, I grew up on Long Island. I really loved TV growing up, and I knew I wanted to write, but I just thought I'd write short stories and fictions, and I was writing a lot of teenage angsty poems. Stuff. <laughs> um, but I, and then at the, by the time I was graduating college, I realized, like, oh, there are people who are actually writing these TV shows. Like, there are people that are paid to do this, and I thought, okay, I can combine two things that I really love. Uh, so I came out to LA and I went to USC for a year for grad school and then I dropped out <laughs> and I went to work as an assistant for two reality show producers. So I got to meet Danny Bonaducci and Corey Feldman. That was fun. Got two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just waiting. That was really what it was all leading to. Um, and then after that, I um, was hired on this animated show, Sit Down, Shut Up, which kind of came and went very quickly. I don't doubt anyone saw it. But it was on Fox for about two minutes. Um, yeah. And that was canceled. <laughs> and then uh, I started working on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I was born white, and uh, <coughs> this wizard appeared on my porch one day and said, you get to write in TV uh, because of this and for no other reason. And they, I was whisked away to a magical world many of you don't know about, uh, <coughs> where opportunities grow on trees, and we roll around in them naked and just shit on them. Uh, <laughs> And it's so fun, and I'm so untalented. No, I, I, uh, I, I, my, my, my story is very similar to Aisha's. Actually, I just grew up like watching TV obsessively at the uh, lower middle class suburbs of Milwaukee. I, 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 I ended up doing improv and stand up, and then was writing a, a comic book uh, with my friend Rob Schraub, who and that got optioned. So we moved out to uh, L.A. thinking that meant we got to write the movie. Uh, we, <laughs> that, that, that's not what that means. Uh, so we, we, we bought our Sid Field book and things and we learned to write a spec screenplay of our own. We got very, very lucky, uh, got repped by UTA, got a meeting with Robert Zemeckis' new company that he was just forming, uh, pitched them like 10 ideas and sold one of them, which was Monster House, which took 10 years to make. In the meantime, we dicked around a lot and uh, I, I, I went through a lot of ups and downs and things and I actually never worked on any staffs of, uh, of anybody else's shows. Um, uh, I just kept writing pilots that didn't, that nobody wanted to shoot and uh, eventually one stuck and that was uh, the community so, now, so I went from total schlub to uh, showrunner which sometimes is a little difficult because I find myself working over people who are really more than qualified like, like, like to be in my position so uh, it's 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 I have my own issues and uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, and, and so that, that's it. I don't know. That's a sh everyone's got the long version of their story, but it's, it's sort of like the headlines are sort of similar to Aisha's, I guess. <laughs> Just watching TV and then going, I want to affect people with through this thing and moving out here and stumbling into a job. <laughs> but back in the seventies, you could be very political on on shows, on you know, sort of like on the family, sort of like that. They did, did issues and stuff. And now we're dealing, working in a time of political political correctness. So. Uh, how, do, how does that affect you guys in, in working on your shows when, um, when you, all of you guys never seem to shy away from like race and gender and all the things that you poke fun at? And, but is it, you know, just how do you navigate through that in working in the writer's room and stuff? 
Well, I don't think any uh, subject is taboo. Um, it does, it's really how you treat the subject. And on the office, Michael Scott is probably the least politically correct boss <laughs> anyone could have. And you know, in real life, people say things, make mistakes, and it, you know, it's it, how people react to that. And um, I don't. Th and I, I also wrote for the Chris Rock show. Um, and it's funny because that staff was about half black, half white. And there are times where we would be pitching things for, to Chris um, for the show, and a white writer would pitch it. I'd be like, oh my god, that's so racist. That's so racist. How can you say that? Who are you? You know. <laughs> um, and then Chris turns around and says it on the air that night because it's coming from Chris. It's funny. So you know, that was probably my education in never shying away from something because it might be a hot and but button issue. And I think in the office, we definitely hit a lot of issues, but hopefully we treat them in a funny and humorous way. Anyone else? I think I, I was I was a product of the 70s. I'm probably the oldest person up here, I would maybe guess, I don't know. But uh, I when I grew up, uh, All in the Family was in syndication. And the 70s were, you're talking about like, Pre-PC, there was like this sort of, in the 70s, it, by my uh, feeling, there was a sort of this, we were getting somewhere, there was a sort of fascination that was happening. It was no less racist than anything racist that happens today, but it was it had a different flavor to it. It was like people were getting fascinated with each other. Uh, we, were like, we, we, we kept going there and kept like talking about it. There was a racial obsession in the late 70s when I was becoming a, a child, and my mom certainly, like I, the story I always tell, which I think typifies growing up in the 70s, is that I was playing with two Sesame Street toys, and one was Gordon and one was L Louise or something. I, the, uh, who knows? Uh, Mr. Hooper, let's say. And uh, and my mom said, uh, "Can are you having fun playing with those dolls?" And I and I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Can you tell me the difference between them?" <laughs> And I and I and I went. I sensed this pressure. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, the answer was I was being raised by a baby boomer who had a beautiful agenda, but she was going to bend my mind for life. Uh, and I, I said, I, "One has a backpack or something that was that nothing to." And she's like, "Very good, because the thing is, one of them's black and one of them's white, and you not noticing that is the most beautiful thing in the world. And your generation can never forget the Holocaust." happened and can never be conscious of race and and she just fucked me up forever <laughs> And I, and, I, and, I, and I entered in the 80s and 90s and stuff. So what, what I am and what I uh, embrace being in, in 2011 in my writer's room is I'm a racially obsessed and therefore technically racist, uh, non-racist, like kind of white liberal. There's a, like make, it's kind of carrying these mistakes. that the, 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 And, and the, I think the, the character who, who most typifies that is Chevy Chase's character. Is that like, like the, it's just foot in mouth, foot in mouth. And I, I'm always trying to make the distinction with the, with the uh, writers and communities writer room, like Pierce isn't genuinely racist. He doesn't think that uh, 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 there's a race that's inferior to any other race. Pierce is a is a is a baby boomer and a liberal and a progressive, and he just th he's just trying to help. He's just trying like th and there's, a, there's a million jokes that typify those like, but it's it, the, the and so I'm always like I'm just constantly obsessed with it. What is racist? What isn't racist? How do I be less racist? How do we get rid of racism? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And how that energy like often leads to, is part of the problem I think is the funniest thing in the world and that's all I can do is just, just like make an ass of myself you know like 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 press the paper to my brain and go that's what it is that's that, that's what's happening so I, I that, that that's post-racial comedy writing for me is just me going I don't know I don't know what's going on there, there was an episode uh, last year that aired on 30 rock and their writers are all in New York so no one's here from this sh that show but it was about diversity and it was about diversity in the workplace where Tufer finds out that he was a diversity hire. And I don't know if you guys remember that episode, but I thought it was a great, the way, I mean, we, we they talked with us a little bit before they did it. And the great thing they found out about it is it was like Tina Fey was a, I mean, Liz Lemons was a diversity hire as well because she they needed more women. And so she was hired because she was a woman. And, you know, I think that that when you approach sh issues like that with, with humor, which all of our shows do really well, I think, and, and also with a little bit of naivete, like Chevy's character has, and and certainly Michael has on The Office as well. You know, um, that's the way you can tackle some kind of real issues, but not doing it in a way that's slamming it over body over anyone's head because it's comedy. So, 
Jose from I, the office, yeah. you're going to... Um, yeah, I think um, mine are first. There, I, I have three clips. One is from an episode uh, I wrote. I have a writing partner um, that I wrote with my writing partner called China, which aired this past, f um, I guess, a year ago at this point. Um, and it's a story um, about Daryl and Andy. And b basically, they're having a texting war. And... It, the theme is basically the language of text between these two guys. Andy really wants to be Daryl's friend, um, and you know it plays out. So I like. 